So, a few lectures ago, I stated this classification theorem for the irreducible representations of SU3, and I haven't actually proved it yet. I've been using it and, you know, drawing these pictures, but I was hoping you'd forgotten by now and I didn't actually prove it. So, I just want to prove it in this video. So what did the theorem say? It said for any pair of integers, uh, non-negative integers, there's an irreducible representation, which is unique up to isomorphism, whose weight diagram is given by this recipe that I gave you. You pick the highest weight, lambda, which is KL1 plus LL2. You apply the elements of the vial group. You take the uh, convex hull, you join the dots between those. And then you take certain lattice points inside and assign those certain uh, dimensionalities according to the vial character formula. Um, so what am I actually going to prove? Well, I'm going to prove that for each weight, lambda, there's a unique highest weight representation, uh, you know, with that as, as, as its sort of vertex that you start with. Uh, I'm not going to prove the dimension formula at the moment, but I am going to prove that you know, these dots are exactly the ones you get. Um, so here's a new piece of paper because I'm going to need dotted paper. Um, so here's what we're actually going to prove. Theorem, given any representation um, of SU3, Uh, if lambda is a highest weight, which I'll define what that means because it's no longer obvious um, for this representation, then there is uh, an irreducible subrepresentation. Um, whose weight diagram is uh, at least supported on the set of lattice points that I told you last time. In other words, the non-zero weight spaces are the lattice points I told you last time. So first of all, what does highest weight mean in this context where you know, we don't have just a line and we don't pick the rightmost thing, right? We're in the plane, there are many directions. So which one do we pick as the highest weight? Um, well, let me just draw the uh, axes. What I need to do is to pick a line that goes through the origin and that doesn't contain any of the other lattice points. So a line of irrational slope with respect to this lattice. Um, so I'm going to pick a line of irrational slope with respect to the lattice. Now, unfortunately, uh, these lines are already irrational slope, right? Because this, this is 120 degrees. So this is like pointing in the like root three uh, to direction or something. Um, so I want something even more irrational than this, like pi. So maybe algebraically independent from root three. So that this line doesn't go through any of these integer points. So which only hits the lattice. at the origin. Okay, then what am I going to do? I'm going to move that line parallel to itself. Uh, if I can select it. I'm going to move it parallel to itself to the right until I sort of hit the edge of my weight diagram. So let me let me put a weight diagram down. Let me actually draw something. So let's let's do the um, 
the accurate representation. So these are our weight spaces. I'm going to pick up this red line. Oh, it's now going to move some of the weight spaces. Uh, I'll try and draw it again. I'm going to pick up the red line and move it to the right, sort of parallel to itself, until it hits the very final point, until it leaves the polygon that we had uh, for our weight diagram. Now there's a unique place where it does this because it's not parallel to any of the edges. If it were parallel to an edge, this red line would contain several integer points in our lattice, but it doesn't, it only contains the origin. So there's a unique point where it sort of leaves the poly polygon. And so this is gonna be our highest weight vector. That's what I mean by highest weight. It's, we have to make a choice we have to choose this line of, uh, you know, irrational slope, and then, you know, then we've chosen what the highest weight means. Of course, we kind of had to choose things for SU2 as well. We could have picked the highest weight as being the furthest to the left, but for historical reasons, we picked the furthest to the right. So there's always a bit of a choice. So now the idea behind the proof of the theorem is exactly the same as for SU2. Uh, so let's give this highest weight a name. Let's call it a lambda. We pick a V, a vector, in the weight space with weight lambda, and as in a non-zero vector with weight lambda, and we apply some combination of Eij's to it. So in SU2, we just applied powers of Y, but now we have various different things we could apply. So apply... Um, R star C E I J to V um, yeah, multiple times, as many times as we can, where E I J, which ones do we actually use um, for those E I J which are negative with respect to the choice of line that we've made. What does that mean? Well, our line, this red line here going through the origin, splits our EIJs in half, right? So I think, um, let me just draw a picture again. So uh, the, this is the adjoint representation. This is the weight space that contains E13. I think this is E12 and E23. These are all on the right hand side of this line of irrational slope. Ooh, that should be a straight line. Right hand side of this line of irrational slope. Whereas these ones, E21, E31 and E32 are all on the left hand side. So these are the negative roots with respect to this choice. And these are the positive roots. So we apply the negative roots. This is the analog of applying powers of Y instead of left-hand side um, things that we're applying. So we apply these negative guys in any combination as often as we want. So for example, we could do R star C E three one applied to R star C of E two one and etc. All all the way up to anything you know any combination of these. And we apply them until we leave the weight diagram. So the claim is this set of vectors that we get by applying these guys some number of times will be a basis for an irreducible subrepresentation. So claim the vectors we get this way. will span an irreducible sub-representation. So, 
So to check this claim, um, what do we need to do? Well, for SU2, you know, we had V, Y, V, Y squared, V, etc. So it was clear that if we applied further powers of Y, we would stay inside this subrepresentation. Also, each of these vectors, V, Y, V, Y squared, V, was a weight vector. So it was an eigenvector of H. So if we apply H, again, we just rescale each of these basis vectors by an eigenvalue. The thing was to check if we apply X, so a positive root, do we still end up with one of these vectors? And the, the proof is entirely the same here. So the proof is, um, you know, if we apply negative roots, uh, then we stay inside the subrepresentation. If we apply um, diagonal matrices H theta, then you know we stay in the subrepresentation because we started with a weight vector with some weight and we ended up with a weight vector with some lower weight. Uh, so each vector in our basis is a weight vector. So just rescales under the action of uh, H theta for any theta. So all we need to check now is what happens if we apply E23, E13 or E12. So we need to check that uh, E i j preserves this subrepresentation. For positive roots EIJ. Okay, we're just going to prove this for E13, because the other one's going to be the same sort of argument. And we're going to prove it by induction. Okay, so I'm going to need a new page. What do I mean by induction here? Uh, well, you know, my basis has the form V and then there's like E21 V, E31 V and E32 V that I could get by applying these negative roots. And then there's things like E21 squared V, E21 E31 V, things that I get by applying two negative vectors. And there's things I get by applying three uh, negative roots four negative roots and so on. Okay, so actually some of these vectors are the same. It turns out E32V uh, is some linear combination of, of these two, but that doesn't matter, that's irrelevant for the proof. So I'm gonna induct on the number of uh, negative roots I need to apply to get to my basis vector. Let's say the minimal number of roots I need to apply. And certainly uh, E13 applied to V is zero because uh, V is a highest weight vector, E13 increases the weight, it moves it to the right. So this has to vanish as V is a highest weight vector. Um, so my indu inductive hypothesis is going to be that E13 of sort of E i j or i one j one up to e i k j k of v um, is in the subrepresentation. In other words, the subrepresentation spanned by these guys, subspace spanned by these guys. So this is supposed to be true, you know, up to some number of k's. This is the case k equals zero. Base case. I want to prove it's true for k plus one things. Okay, so let's just check. If I do E13 and then I have an extra negative root here, it's one of three things. It's either E31, E32 or E21. And then there's some more stuff like E, I1, J1, 
up to E, I, K, J, K, V. Okay, so what I need to do is for each of these three cases, I need to check that this is some linear combination of these basis vectors. Well, E13, E31 equals E13, E31 brackets plus E31, E13. This is, you know, just by definition of the brackets, if I subtract E31, E13 from this, then I, I precisely get the bracket. Um, remember, all over the place I'm writing EIJ instead of R star EIJ, it just simplifies notation. Um, okay, well, uh, let's assume that our first um, negative root here is E31. Well then, E13, E31, followed by all this extra negative stuff, um, is equal to, by this formula, equal to E13, E31 times all the negative stuff uh, plus E31, E13 times all the negative stuff. So I can deal with the two terms separately. First of all, this guy, E31, E13 times all the negative stuff. I can use induction now because I've got E13 times negative stuff of length k. So by induction, this is in the subrepresentation, and I already know that if I apply a negative root, I stay inside the subrepresentation. So this is in the subrepresentation by induction. Up here, E13 brackets E31, I can compute and it turns out to be H13, which is this 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, minus 1. Uh, that's one of my diagonal matrices and anything, any of these basis vectors here is a weight vector with some weight, right? Because V was sort of weight lambda and each time I apply one of these EIJs, I just change the weight. I'm still a weight vector, but just from different weight. So this is still a weight vector here. In other words, it's an eigenvector for all the diagonal matrices. So in particular, if I apply H13 to it, I just get it rescaled. So again, this guy is in the subrepresentation. As in, when I apply H13, it's still in the subrepresentation. And because it's a subspace, you know, the sum of these two things is in the subrepresentation. So overall, this is in the subrepresentation. Okay, so there are two more cases. I'm not going to do them. I'll leave them as an exercise where this second uh, guy is E32 or E21. Um, they're slightly different, but similar in nature. Okay, so coming back to the theorem, what I've proved is given any representation of SU3, you pick a highest weight using this uh, line of irrational slope, and then you know you generate an irreducible subrepresentation um, by applying EIJs which are on the left of this line of irrational slope. Great. So what I want to use this for is to prove the uniqueness of the irreducible subrepresentation with a given highest weight. In other words, we want there to be only one possible subrepresentation with a given highest weight. Um, 